Now, tonight, we're so excited to learn how to pick locks. For as long as have there, for as long as there have been locks, people have devised ways to get past them. And for as long as there has been crime fiction, it's reflected our fascination with picking locks and getting into places we shouldn't. Join us as writer, podcaster, and lock sport. Lock sport. I didn't know that was. <laughs> Hobbyist Matthew Porter talks about the history of locks, the basics of lock picking, and ways to include realistic lock picking in your fiction. Or just bust the door down. That's what they always do, right? <laughs> Matthew Porter writes detective stories, 20th century historical mysteries, and is working on a cozy mystery featuring a locksmith with a shady past. Mm -hmm. He is also a Colorado attorney and a consultant on managing digital evidence. Online, Matthew talks about retro pop culture as co-host of the Intermillennial Media Project podcast and reviews movies and movie theaters on YouTube. I did not. Mm -hmm. When he's not trying to improve his lock picking skills, he can be found driving a Mini Cooper on twisty mountain roads. So welcome, Matthew. Hey, great, thanks. Uh, one thing as we get started, uh, Brooke, I gave you a little uh, case with some lock picks in it. Just to pass that around, just I thought it would be nice for you to get a, a sense of what is kind of the size, the, the weight, the, the, the feel of these. Uh, just whoever ends up with it at the end, uh, hang on to it and uh, it'll get back to me at the end. And for those on Zoom, uh, I'm sorry that I'm not able to share this with you in the same way, but this is a photograph of the tools that I'm passing around here in the room. Uh, and that's a three by five card. For uh, for scale, and the one going from top to bottom, those are a pick, or a, a hook rather, a hook, a rake, and a attention tool or a turning tool. And uh, my hope is that by the end of this, you'll uh, you'll know what those are and how they might be used. So, long long ago, thousands of years ago. Some human being regarded some stuff and said, that's my stuff. I don't want anybody else getting at my stuff. So we're creatures of ingenuity. We figured out ways to keep other people from getting at our stuff. You can hide your stuff, put it where no one else can find it. You can stand guard over your stuff. You can hire other people to stand guard over your stuff. And all of those solutions, they have their pros and their cons. But at some point, somebody thought, what if I put my stuff someplace where other people can't get at it, even if they know where it is? What if I put my stuff behind a door or inside a box that only I can open? So we invented locks. And just in case you think I'm exaggerating a little bit when I say this started thousands of years ago, I've got a little video I want to show you. There's no audio to this, it's just a video illustration. That's a, a doorway that it's going across. This is the reverse, so you can see how the mechanism works. Now that's a, a, a replica of a kind of lock mechanism, uh, lock design that is, has been found in, in sites in Egypt and in Assyria, in modern day Iran. And it's been variously dated from 700 to 2000 BC. So we've been making locks for a long time. And I don't think it was too long after, this is less well documented, but I don't think it was too long after people started using locks that other people started to think, I don't have the key, but I still want that stuff. <laughs> and they figured out ways to get past those locks. Now this lock, it's big, it's clunky. I wouldn't want to carry that key around on my belt, but we kind of recognize it as a lock. And there are a lot of things about it that are similar to a lock that you would see today. This is what I'm showing here is what I think of as a locking system. The lock is one part of this, or what we think of as a lock is one part of this. But the whole system is there's something that is designed to move. It's a door, the lid of a chest. 
And then there's something that keeps it from moving, the deadbolt in your door, the bolt that goes across the front of the door, like in that uh, video we saw, um, a hasp on a, a chest that is secured by a padlock. It keeps the lid that otherwise could move from moving. Then there's the lock mechanism itself. And that's what we think of as the lock and what we talk about when we're picking locks. This is a mechanism that controls that bolt or that bar keeps it from moving or lets you move it when you want to. And then there's the key, an object, something that engages or disengages that lock mechanism. And all of those are present in the door on your house today and all of those were present in that lock from a few thousand years ago. Now to, to know how to pick locks, you kind of have to understand how locks work. So I'm going to start with an older kind of lock uh, and we'll, we'll move on to more modern locks. Now the warded lock for centuries, this was the height of lock technology. And if you're dealing with, if you write in historical settings, this is probably a kind of lock that you're gonna have to, to deal with if you're dealing with locks. And they haven't disappeared completely. You can still find warded locks today, but they, they began to be replaced in say the mid 19th century. Now what a warded lock is, it's a, there's a mechanism that, that needs to turn in order to move the bolt back and forth. Of course, that mechanism can only be turned from inside the lock. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a lock, it would be a doorknob. But you can't just stick anything inside the lock because inside the lock are these shapes, these obstructions called wards. And you need the key that is designed, that's shaped to go around those wards to avoid those obstructions in order to turn the mechanism of the key inside. And you've all seen examples of the kind of key that goes along with a warded lock. Usually when we think of an old fashioned key, that's what we're thinking of, and those are warded locks. Those shapes at the end of those long keys, those are kind of a, a negative image of what the barriers, what the wards inside the lock look like. And as I said, they're not really gone. The warded locks you can still find. Here's a more modern kind of warded lock. Warded locks are not really used in any high security applications today, but you might find them on cabinetry where the locks are mainly decorative. You might find them on certain office furniture or luggage locks. And some things that are, are kind of giveaways on this the fact that they're warded locks. Um, you've got the keys that are cut here, but there's no difference in height. Either there's a cut or there's no cut. That's typically what you'd see in a warded lock compared to the key you probably have for your front door, which has lots of different heights for a jagged. And we'll talk about why that is in a modern lock a bit. So how do you pick a warded lock? Well, again, you kind of have to understand something about how those warded locks work inside. And the, the trick to a warded lock is not everything on those fancy complicated keys actually does anything. A lot of all that stuff that's on the end there, very complicated. That's there to obfuscate what's really happening inside the lock. And it's to make sure that if you have a key for another uh, instance of the same design of lock, you can't use that other key because it's not designed for the same exact wards. But if you know that only certain parts of that key have to do anything, you can make something that only has those parts. And that's where we get the idea of skeleton key. Sometimes you'll hear people refer to kind of any example of those long old fashioned warded lock keys as a skeleton key. That's not exactly correct. Because what a skeleton key is, is when you take a lock like, a, a key like that, and you cut away the parts you don't need. You file them away or cut them away. You only leave the parts that actually do something that has to happen inside the lock. Only the bare bones of the key. And now that key will open lots of locks. Here we've got the, uh, the, the actual key over on the, uh, the top left illustration. And then we've got a skeleton key cut from that kind of key. There might be a lot of other locks that have different shapes inside there because the wards are shaped differently. But if we know that we only need those two levers to do anything, that skeleton key will open up that whole series of locks. Here are some skeleton keys cut from more modern 
uh, warded lock keys. Because these keys are designed that only the little piece at the very end is what turns the lock. You can cut away a little wrist. And now in the bottom here, that skeleton key would open up the lock design with either one of those keys in it. And in addition to skeleton keys, maybe you don't know what kind of lock you're going to be dealing with. Maybe you need to have flexibility. You can get sets of picks, or sometimes they're called sets of skeleton keys for warded locks, like I've got here, where these are just lots of different shapes that tend to reflect typical warded locks. And by experimenting with how deep you go, what angle you use, you try a few of these, even if it's a warded lock you don't know a lot about, you can probably figure out a combination of depth and angle and which key that'll pop that lock open. Now to make warded locks more secure, there are limitations in what you can do. The main way to make a warded lock more secure is to make it more complicated, add more, more complicated wards inside, and also make the key more complicated so that you can't look at the key and get an idea as to what needs to happen inside the lock. Now, modern locks today are pin tumbler locks. The mid 19th century, a guy named Linus Yale, I came up with the idea of a pin tumbler lock. But you'll notice probably as I describe this, there are things that it has in common with that ancient wooden lock. But in, uh, in the 1840s, Linus Yale Sr. developed something like the modern pin tumbler lock. In the 1860s, Linus Yale Jr. refined it with a narrower key. And the one that was ones from the 1860s are very much like a pin tumbler lock you might find on the door of a house today. And if you've ever shopped for locks recently, that name Yale is probably familiar. They still mm -hmm. make a lot of locks. And the way a pin tumbler lock works is that it's in two main parts. There's a housing, it's called a cylinder lock also for obvious reasons. You've got a housing that holds the lock. And then inside the housing is what's called a plug. It fits into a hole in the housing. And the key goes into that plug and can turn that plug within the house. So far, so good. But what just stops you from turning it at will? That's because there are holes that are drilled through the housing and the plug that line up. And in each one of those holes are pins or pin stack. This pin stack at the very bottom there, the green section, that's what's called the key pin. Above that is called the driver pin. And in that white space up above, that would be a spring to keep a little bit of pressure to make sure that those uh, pin stacks stay on the bottom. And this line here, that's the line where the plug meets the housing, where would, they would rotate opposite one another. But as long as those driver pins are crossing that shear line, partly in the housing, they're partly in the plug, those pins, they're tiny, but they're tough metal. You can't turn that plug. Therefore, you can't turn that lock. So how do you turn it with a key? Well, the key lifts those pins to the exact right distance so that the where the driver pin meets the key pin is lined up exactly on that shear line. Then you can turn the plug. And You'll notice that those key pins, they're all different sizes, all different heights. And they're called key pins because that's what matches your key. The reason your key is jagged in that way is that each one of those hills and valleys in the key matches the height by which the key has to lift that particular pin that's in that position when the key's fully inserted. As long as that happens, you can rotate that plug with ease. The driver pins stay up in the housing, the key pins stay down in the plug and the key can turn the lock. But what if you don't have that key? Well, we know how it works. We've got to get those driver pins out of the way. But how do we get those driver pins out of the way without a key? Well, one way to do that is by picking the lock. And one of the ways of picking the lock is, is kind of the most fundamental single pin picking. That means you're reaching in there with a tool and you're feeling around so you can feel the pins and you're lifting each pin up one by one instead of all at the same time like you would with the key. And that's great, but then what happens if you lift one of them, you move on to another pin, 
What prevents that first pin from falling back down because it's got that spring on top? Well, the reason that's possible is that no lock is perfect. Ideally, a perfect lock cylinder, all the holes will be lined up on the center line of that cylinder exactly like you see at the top there. But manufacturing isn't perfect. Certainly it's not perfect uh, at a, in a way that can be mass produced in an affordable manner. Realistically, every lock is going to be made accurate within certain tolerances, but they're going to be little flaws. The pin, the holes are not going to be lined up exactly right. The second part of this is that you're not just using that hook to push the pins up. There's another tool that you're gonna have in that lock. And that is called the, the tension tool or the turning tool. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a tension wrench. I think that's a little misleading because a wrench suggests you're putting a lot of force into it. And the opposite is true. You're putting a tiny bit of force because you still wanna be able to move those pins, but you're putting a little bit of rotational force as you're poking those pins upward with the hook. And what's happening here, you can see that as you turn, a little tiny shelf is created by the outside of the plug. Now, at, because the pins are not lined up perfectly, at any given time, there's really only one pin that is stopping that whole cylinder from turning, that whole plug from turning. So when you're picking the lock, you're looking for that pin. You're looking for the pin that is binding, the one that's hardest to move. You don't want to put so much rotational pressure that you can't move it, but you're going to, you're going to tell that one of them is harder to move than the other, so that's the binding pin. You lift that binding pin up while you put that rotation on it, and that's when you get a little click. And the click is what happens here when it, the cylinder turn, the plug turns a tiny bit, and the driver pin is held up by that little shelf that's created. And as you go through, once that's in place, then you look for the next pin that is binding and you lift that up until you get that to click into place. And they might not be in, in all in line. You might go to one pin, skip several, go to the next pin, lift that up, get that to click into place. When you get that final pin clicked into place, that means all the driver pins are above the shear line and suddenly, you can turn that plug. And that's that's kind of the rush of lock picking. As you go through these, you pick each one, suddenly you get that final click and the whole thing turns. And it's like discovering a superpower. Like, I shouldn't be able to do this, but I just did. And that's the, the basics of single pin lock picking, is just picking them one at a time, getting them set above that shear line, click at a time until they're all set there. And the way to, one of the ways to make a, um, a pin tumbler lock like this more secure is just to add more pins. A, a seven pin lock is going to be harder to pick than a three pin lock simply because you've got more pins to pick. And the more pins to pick, the more chances there are for something to go wrong, like, you accidentally let, two, let a little of that pressure off with the turning tool and some of your pins that were set fall back down. You've got to start again, things like that. Another way you can make a pin tumbler lock more secure is to change what the driver pins look like. This is showing, this is, these, these diagrams are showing what the driver pins would typically look like. They're just smooth cylinders. And by the way, we are talking really tiny, even that little shelf that they sit on, we're talking fractions of a millimeter, but, it doesn't take a whole lot to keep one of those pins out of the way once you get it in place. But to make things more secure, you can put in what are called security pins. They're usually put in place of the driver pins. And those are pins that instead of being smooth cylinders, they're mushroom shaped or they're spool or spindle shaped, or they have, they're serrated, they have little grooves in them. Because what the person is designing the security is trying to do is, it wants to give that pin other places where it can catch on that shear line or on the edge of that housing. And you can get what's called a false set. I think I've got it up there. I heard and felt the click, but it was really clicking on one of the many edges of a spool shaped pin. It wasn't really clicking completely out of the way. And of course, then there are techniques and ways to kind of figure out, is that a false set or a real set? And how do I get around that little 
false edge on the driver pin to push the whole thing out of the way. And by the way, I mentioned that warded locks are completely gone. Warded locks, the warded lock technique can also be combined with a pin tumbler lock to make a lock more complicated and secure. The very fact that when you look at the keyhole on your, your, your lock, it's kind of squiggly. That's kind of a war. Only things, only keys with the certain profile are going to fit into that lock. Now there are some other techniques for picking locks because but they all come down to wanting to get those driver pins out of the way up above the shear lock. Two of the basic ones are called raking and picking. And there you're essentially playing the odds. You're putting a little bit of that turning force on there with the tension tool. And you're using a tool. I, you can do this with a regular hook shaped uh, lock pick, or there are uh, lock picks designed specifically for raking. And you're just kind of moving them back and forth across the keys, figuring that one after another, whichever pins are binding are eventually going to all get caught above the shear line. Jiggling is similar, it's just a slightly different. Um, method. Some people would refer to either of these as a kind of raking, uh, but it's really just a, a quick, and if somebody's really trying to get through a lock quickly, and they have some sense that this lock might be susceptible to, to raking or jiggling, that's the first thing they'll try, because it can be really quick. I, I wasn't going to do any like, demonstrations, because A, it can be boring, it take a while to do like single pin picking, but raking or jiggling are the closest that lock picking sorts to kind of seems to a, a magic trick. So I'm going to give this a try. This is a, a lock. I bought it. I uh, forget where I bought it, but you can go to a hardware store. If you think of a padlock brand, you probably can think of this brand. And it's an absolutely regular lock. It'll open with its key. Well, let's say I don't have the key. So I'm going to use a, a rake that has three little points and uh, just this L-shaped turning tool. <laughs> and there are hundreds or thousands of sheds and toolboxes and everything else that are secured by these pins, by, by, these, uh, by these locks. And it's that easy to open them without a whole lot of skill just by kind of knowing what the theory is. Oh, and by the way, they, you can also get tools that are, they're, they're called jigglers, some of them. They're essentially key-shaped things with lots of edges on them. And you kind of, if, if you have a sense that this is a susceptible lock, you can put it in there, start jiggling it around as you're turning it the way you would a key. And some locks will just pop open with these jigglers. They're often sold in like sets. So you can you can try and maybe one of these six jigglers will get you through this lock quickly. And if it doesn't, then maybe you go to this kind of raking or jiggling with a, a different tool, or you go to single pin picking. A lot of what we're talking about comes down to speed, or what you want in terms of speed and in terms of, of not being obtrusive about it. Because it's not that hard to get through a door if you don't care who knows it. There are easier ways to get through a door or into a locked box than by picking the lock. You can use a hatchet, you can use dynamite, you can pull, you can use a, just smash the, the door hinges. But there are two things that you're trying to avoid when you're going to something like lock picking. And that is, you don't want it to be, um, you don't want it to be obvious what you're doing at the time you're doing it. If you're using dynamite to get through a door, anybody, everybody's gonna have an idea of what you're doing. You also might not want it to be evident. You might not want someone after the facts to be able to tell you got in here. Because if you're carefully picking a lock, then only somebody who really knows what to look for and is examining it really closely might be able to see some telltale scratches that would indicate that this was picked as opposed to opened with a key. Uh, because really you're operating the mechanism in the same way that the key is supposed to, you're just doing it with different tools and a different technique. You're being, you're, you're being non-obvious and you're trying to be uh, covert about it. You're not being evident after that. Matthew, on the sure. you open the padlock, would, that, would you say that's a, a jiggle, jiggler? This is a, a rake or a jiggler. Let me try something here. This is a um, tool. It's just got like three peaks. It's kind of a way, it's a, a straight pick with a wavy end to it. And you could, this, uh, I think, I think of this as a rake. 
Well, the technique I was using is probably more similar to jiggling. Since raking, strictly speaking, is just moving the, the, the tool straight in and out of the block, I was also giving it a little up and down motion. But the key is I was also giving it that little bit of, of turning force. And again, you don't want too much turning force or the, the keys, the, the, the pins won't be able to move. Too, uh, too little turning force and they won't set into place above the shear line if they do. Another technique that can be used is bumping. And again, it uses the same idea. You want to move those driver pins out of the way. But this is, it's, it can be, what, for locks that are susceptible to it, it can be very, very quick. And it uses the same principle as those Newton's cradle desktop toys where you've got the line of silver balls and you drop one, it smacks one end and the ball on the other end flies up because the force has been transmitted through. What you're doing with bumping is you're applying force to the bottom of the key pins and you want that force to be transmitted to the driver pins to just bump those driver pins up and out of the way. You can do it just by ramming that bump key in quickly. They're often done with a little hammer or mallet. I don't know if you can see here, but the bump key is basically a, a simple key blank that would be designed for this lock, but it's cut so that it's just got lots of shallow peaks and valleys, because all you want to be able to do is make contact with the bottoms of the key pins, no matter how big the key pins are. And again, if you're turning that key a tiny bit as you bump it, then as soon as those driver pins clear the shear line, you'll be able to turn it the rest of the way, just as if it was the key design for the lock. And there are some other tools that use that same principle that they sort of automate that bumping idea. One is a snap gun. It's sort of a spring-loaded thing that's designed, you gotta get the angle just right, but it's just designed to snap and hit all of those key pins at the same time and bump the, the driver pins out of the way. An electric pick is really just a, a snap gun with an electric motor. It vibrates that long skinny pick very rapidly. The idea being that eventually you're gonna look out if you do it enough times. And as you turn the tool, while it's vibrating the lock, it will vibrate those driver pins out of the way and you can turn it. So these for, for individuals or organizations that like need to be able to get through locks very quickly, this kind of electric pick or snap gun might be part of their arsenal. Now, so far we've talked about pin tumbler locks, which really are the most commonly found lock today. We also talked about rewarded locks. I just want to acknowledge the fact that there are some other kinds of locks that, uh, that you might encounter. Lever locks, they work similar to pin tumblers, but I mean, they all work similar in that there's something that's preventing the bolt from moving. But a lever, there are a series of stacked levers inside and the keys are set up so that they move each lever the exact right distance so that the bolt is clear and everything can move. Wafer locks, you'll find these in things like file cabinets and the like. They also are, they're more similar to pin tumbler locks in that there's something that moves up and down, but instead of the stack of pins, it's a, a set of metal wafers with holes in them. And those wafers have to be lined up just right in order to allow the key to turn. And the key is what lines those wafers up just right. There are definitely techniques for, um, for picking wafer locks and lever locks. Lever locks can actually be very difficult because it's hard to know exactly where's the pivot point? What's the shape of those levers inside? But there are sets of picks you can get that have usually little square flag shaped ends that are designed to manipulate levers. For wafer locks, you would typically have a set of picks kind of like this, which are designed, the ends would work with lots of different kinds of wafer sets. And again, you try different ones, you jiggle them around a little bit, one of these would probably work on most of the wafer locks that you find. And disc detainer locks. That's a tough one because in theory, disc detainer locks can be very secure, very tough. The way they work is there's this sidebar that's outside the stack of discs. And in the edges of the discs are what's called the gate. And when that, when all the discs are lined up just right, that gate is open across the entire stack of discs and the sidebar 
can fall into that gate and out of the way of the rest of the mechanism and the lock can turn. And the, what can make disk container locks really, uh, really secure is the fact you can put lots of other notches and grooves around the edges of those disks. And that means you've got what are called false gates. You turn, you're turning, if you're trying to do the equivalent of single pin picking, turning each of these uh, disks at a time, you might turn one, you get a nice satisfying click. Oh, okay, that's, I found the gate. Really what you found is a false gate. When you find, you go to the next uh, disk, whether you get to a true gate or a false gate, it's not gonna line up with what you had on the first disk. There are tools and there are ways to kind of feel what is a false gate versus a true gate. And that's really what a lot of lock picking comes down to. It's, it's understanding that feedback that you're getting from the tool. What does it feel like when it's a real click as opposed to getting caught on one of the security pins or getting caught on a false gate? A lot of it is kind of visualizing what's happening inside and working out what the changes are based upon how it sounds and how it feels. And the reason I said that the, the disk to hair lock situations can be iffy is that they can be very expensive to make. And there are a lot of cheap disc detainer locks that are manufactured and imported. And if they're made of cheap materials or they're not carefully constructed, it can be easy to break them or otherwise get through them. So a good design, not always really well implemented when you're actually going to buy a lock. Now, one question that comes up fairly often talking about lock picks is, is all of this legal? Uh, oh, and before I, I go on to this, my standard disclaimer, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. <laughs> uh, if you do need, none, none of what I'm saying is legal advice. If you need legal advice, talk to somebody who's licensed in your jurisdiction, who uh, is familiar with the area of law. That's the question. All of that said, there is this idea. I remember when I was a kid, there was this idea that lockpicks, it's illegal to have lockpicks. You're going to go to jail if you have a lockpick. And that's not true. By and large, lockpicks are not illegal. How you use lockpicks can be very illegal. And the fact that you did something illegal with a lockpick can create a, an extra charge that you might be charged. All of the states here in green, those are states in which either because it's specifically allowed by statute or because there's no law against it, lockpicks are legal. Again, if you're using them in the course of a burglary, then they're burglary tools and that might change, might indicate uh, a different you know, level of of preparedness and so on, but by and large, having lockpicks, not a problem. The states that are in red here, uh, Nevada, Ohio, Virginia, those are states in which it's not illegal to have lockpicks, but having lockpicks can be used by a prosecutor as what's called prima facie evidence of criminal intent. So if they want to accuse, if, so let's say there's a law about you're in a place you're not allowed to be. That might be simple trespass. But if you're in that place you're not allowed to be with criminal intent, with the intent to commit a crime, then that's a whole different, maybe that's now a felony. That's a, a more serious charge. To prove that criminal intent part, all the prosecutor would have to do is prove he had a set of lock picks for him. Criminal intent is proven. You would then have to somehow prove, well, even though I had lock picks, I didn't have criminal intent. And that can be tough. So that's that's the issue in those states in, in, uh, in red. Mississippi is a strange one because well, it's perfectly legal to have lock picks unless they are concealed. <laughs> so you can walk around with lock picks in your hand all day and it's not, not, not a crime. But you put them in your pocket, suddenly it's illegal. So unless you're carrying them around or I've been thinking maybe for Mississippi, I'd have a hat with a hat bin designed to store lock picks. I think that would be legal. Um, but yeah, as soon as they're concealed, it's it's not legal. And speaking of concealed lockpicks, uh, over here we've got something interesting. I don't know if they're available, anymore, but we've got these stylish earrings. And if you know what lockpicks look like, you would probably recognize we've got. We've got turning tools, we've got rakes, we've got hooks, we've got what's called a half diamond, another shape of lockpick. Um, I'm sure they look delightful until you 
take them off when you need to use them. And, that's good. and on the other side there, there's a lot of companies that make these. These are examples of, of cards that you get. It's a thin steel card. You can keep it in your wallet. Don't do that in Mississippi. <laughs> keep it in your wallet and you can punch those out easily and have those tools available. So this one has, you can see at the top there, it's got a hook. It's got a three peaked rake, like the ones I used to pop that, uh, that padlock. It's got a jiggler in the middle there with the keyhole in the, in the handle. There's a handcuff key, um, a wafer lock key, and then a, a turning tool at the very bottom. This tool, I don't know if you can see that outline over here on the far right-hand side of that card. That can be used as a turning tool for certain kinds of locks. It can also be used as what's called a comb pick. A comb pick is another way to pick a lock, which it forgets about trying to just push the driver pin and line up that gap between the key pin and the driver pin at the shear line. A comb pick, you just, you're going to push all the pins above the shear line, key pin and all. You need a comb that's going to match the spacing and location of the of the, the pinholes in your, your lock, but it's a very kind of uh, um, very abrupt and very effective kind of picking if you've got the right pick and the right kind of lock. But you can get a lot of different versions of that kind of card where you can carry around lock picks, punch them out when they need to. It's very thin metal. They're not going to last a long time, but it's one of those, well, I've got a holdout in case I ever need these in an emergency. <laughs> and other things I've seen are things like, uh, like couplings, handcuff keys built into them. I don't know when I would need that, but it would be cool. Where do we get them? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have some information about that. There are a lot of companies that uh, that sell lock picks to hobbyists now because it's become a bigger and bigger hobby. Uh, we mentioned the term lock sport earlier. That's a term that was 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 coined. <laughs> Because people who pick locks as a hobby and because they're fascinated by this, they wanted something just to distinguish what they did from either someone who picks locks as part of their profession or trade, like a locksmith, and someone who's picking locks for nefarious purposes. A lock sport is kind of picking locks for fun and interest and, and edification. And there are there are competitions with lock sport, and there are people who will create challenge locks and send them to other people. So there are competitive. Lock sport folks, they're just, I don't compete in any way. So it's like running. Some people compete in races, they run competitively, and some people just run. For me, one of the things is, is picking locks. So if you're going to incorporate lock picking or a scene or a character involving lock picking into your fiction, a couple of suggestions. One is to have a sense, now that you know something about the way lock picking works, Get a sense of, have an idea of what kind of lock this would be, what kind of lock would make sense to be if, if it's on a door of a house or if it's in a high security facility or if it's a, a padlock uh, securing a trunk, what kind of lock would it be? And what would be the right way to pick that off? What kind of tools might the character want to use? And what is your character's level of skill? Is this going to be easy for them? They've done this 100,000 times or, is this something that oh, they're desperate, so they're going to try this? I mean, maybe they've heard something about lock picking. One thing I, I that really bugs me is when I see a lock picking scene on TV or a movie, and the lock picking in uh, consists of a of like a straight hairpin and thirty seconds and no experience. That's rarely going to get you to a lock. <laughs> but if you know what you're doing and you've got say one or two bobby pins, you could take those two bobby pins or break one of them in half. Bend one of them into a turning tool. Maybe use the other as a rake. And if that doesn't work, bend it into a hook and try to pick the locks. You absolutely can improvise lock picking tools. And But if you know how lock picking works, you can describe that improvisation. You can describe the materials they decide to use and do that more accurately and more compellingly. Oh, and I skipped one here. If you have a character whose lock picking is part of what they do, either because uh, uh, for, for good reasons or bad. And what is their everyday carry? What lock picks tools do they like? What do they carry around with them? Every uh, My everyday carry is pretty much this set here. If I don't literally carry it every day, but if I might want my lock picks with me, this is the, the case that I'll toss into my uh, satchel. And it's got a bunch of, a few hooks, a bunch of different rakes and a few different turning tools. Because depending on the size of the keyway, you might want different turning tools, either ones that can be more forceful, ones that will fit 
bigger or narrower keyways. But really, realistically, I could probably strip my everyday carry down to something more like that set that I passed around earlier. Three or four tools that would handle 85 to 95% of what I would likely encounter. And then if there was something that I, um, if I was expecting that I might encounter an unusual lock, there might be another tool that I would use. This, for example, is a tool designed to work with those uh, disk detainer locks because it's got little markings here that will let you adjust the depth and know exactly how deep into the lock you are. It's got a little flag or paddle shaped bit on the end that, so for certain locks, if you know you're going to encounter them, you might have specialized tools you can bring. So you think about, you know, what, what kind of lock picking does your character do? What are they going to carry around with them? Do they have a hat because they're from Mississippi? <laughs> now, if you're interested in getting started, in practicing and trying out lock picks. You can go to online retailers or other places and uh, and you can buy starter lock picks, which will have probably a couple of different size, uh, size and shape of hooks, a couple of rakes, one or two turning tools. And that would be a, you know, a great way to get started. And very often you can get those starter sets with either a cutaway lock or a see-through lock like we've got here. And those can be really useful. My one suggestion is, don't stay with those cutaway or see-through locks very long. Try, use them because they can be useful for really giving you an up-close idea as to what's happening inside a lock when you're picking. <laughs> but when you're picking other locks, you're not going to be able to see what's inside. So it's important to move on from those into non-practice locks of that sort so that you can begin to develop the sense of creating in your mind a picture of what's happening inside that lock and getting a feel for, for that based upon the tools. And that's important, you know, in terms of the everyday carry, when I'm gonna single pin pick a lock, unless there's something unusual about that lock, the pick that I'll probably go to is from the first lock pick set that I got. It's not great, it's kind of crude, it's got edges that mess up with my fingers, but I've used it a lot so I know it and I can kind of trust the feedback that I get from it. I know what a click feels like from this pick, and I know what a real click feels like versus a click on the edge of a security. Pick. So maybe your character has something like that. It's not the best lock pick in the world, but it's the one that he likes, that she likes. And you can also get what, uh, they're sometimes called graduated sets. You can get the starter lock picks and then a set of locks of increasing difficulties. They can be very useful. I don't tend to recommend them as for their cost. What they're often, what they often do is like there'll be the, the, the level one will just have one or two pins and then the next one will have more pins. And that can be useful, especially to get that satisfying click and turn really early. But you're going to outgrow those, those practice lock picks very quickly once you get started here. So you might be better off just getting one or two of these cutaway or see-through locks and then getting your hands on just real locks to practice. Oh, and one note about practicing and some suggestions. Do, of course, don't open locks that are yours <laughs> or that you don't have explicit permission from the person who owns that lock. And also I'd suggest don't use locks that are really in use for something important, even your own, because it is very possible to break locks, particularly, especially if you're practicing. There are padlocks that I was starting out, I only had a few locks, so I picked them over and over and over again. And there are locks that I've broken just by picking them up. Uh, you compare how many times you can pick a lock in an hour versus how many times you're really going to use a key in a real world situation. And also lock picks can break and they can break off inside locks. There are a lot of ways that lock picking can damage a lock, especially if you do a lot. So don't practice on the lock that you're counting on to secure your, your house. And here are some, uh, some suggested resources if you want to learn more. Uh, learn lock picking and art of lock picking there. At the top, they very, very graciously allowed me to use some of the diagrams that were in these slides. And they also sell lock picks, a lot of good and useful uh, training and information on those sites. Uh, Sparrow's Lock Picks is a, uh, a company from whom I buy a lot of my tools just because I think they're they well made and they've got a lot of variety. Um, 
tool, T-O-O-O-L, the open organization of block pickers, is, is an, exactly what it sounds like. It's an organization for hobbyist lock pickers. And there are a lot of, lot of good information on their site. There tends to be a group for each, um, for each nation or for, for a lot of different countries. That's the tool.us is the, uh, the US organization. And finally, there is a lot of lock picking stuff on YouTube. And that can be really useful, really interesting. And different, uh, different people have different kind of focuses on their channels. Bosnia and Bill, really a lot of useful information. Bosnia and Bill is actually retired from creating videos on YouTube, but there are a lot of videos still up there that you can learn a lot from. Lock Noob is, um, he is a lock picker. He tends to focus on different kinds of tools and also custom design some tools. He also builds challenge locks. He's from the UK, so you'll sometimes see him working with European locks, so locks that are a little bit different from what we see in the US in terms of the size of the key, the size of the cylinder, size of the keyway. It's another reason why that can be interesting. Oh, I was talking about security pins earlier. Uh, Lock Noob, he created some custom security pins that are shaped like chess pieces. So they're very effective as security pins. Chess pieces have really convoluted, interesting shapes, but it's also the kind of thing where no one would know this unless they're a lock nerd and they're disassembling it to rekey it. And lock picking lawyer, he is a, a lawyer who's a lock, lock pick hobbyist, and he tends to focus on security of locks and safes and other things. And he'll point out when something is really not very secure, and he'll demonstrate that by being able to open it in a few seconds, usually by picking the lock, sometimes by showing that there is some other way to exploit this lock to bypass it. And by the way, speaking of bypass, there are a lot of other ways to open locks that I haven't talked about. For example, you can cut out of a soda can a little shim and open a lot of padlocks just by pushing it into the right part of that padlock. So I've focused on lock picking, but there are a lot of other ways to open locks or bypass methods that don't even require you to mess with the pins or the wafers or the discs. Oh, and I'll, I'll give you a warning though. If you do start watching lock pick videos, they get a little addictive, and then you're gonna have to be explaining to your family while you're staring at your computer screen, watching things like this. Is binding. Nice click there. A little bit of a false set. Nothing on four. Five is binding, and we got this open. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's possible to watch hours of those, and then real, what am I doing? Why am I watching? It's still fascinating. That's uh, that's the lock picking lawyer, by the way. That would put. So I hope this was useful. I'm happy to hang around. If there are any questions, anybody's got? Sure. Okay. So some years ago, I read about like you can break into a parked car that's locked using a tennis ball. Have you heard that? I don't know. I have not. It's something like you, know, you cut a hole in the tennis ball and you squeeze it. Oh, you're pressurizing the lock itself. There are some locks that are, if you pressurize it, it's kind of like a comb pick, but with air pressure. I don't know specifically about car locks, but in theory, that kind of makes some sense. I didn't try it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times on TV shows, you'll see someone jimmy a lock open with like a credit card. Mm -hmm. How realistic is that? It's completely outdated. Or that can work. And the idea is there, you're not really acting on the lock, you're acting on the latch. If the latch, a latch that's designed to automatically engage when a door is closed, it's going to be flat on, the, on one side to prevent, prevent it from opening, but it's going to be curved on the other side so that it can close and latch itself when the door closes. If you've got that kind of um, of door and that's all that's holding that door, if you're on the side that has the curve, and it's locked so you can't turn the handle to open it, you can push something in and pushing against that curve, slide that out of the way. If you're on the other side of a latch like that, you can have, a, there are tools, there are even some of these like card shaped tools, but they've got a cutout in it. So you can go over the latch and then down and pull, and that'll engage the curved part and slide that out of the way. Now, of course, there are latches that are designed to to get around or to uh, to protect against that now. But yeah, there are kinds of doors, especially interior doors that could still be open with that kind of credit card or something similar. 
Yeah, I if you have any electric slash electronic lock, fine, you've got something that does this or that or whatever, but is it a, it's, it's still the same kind of, of mechanism which is just a bit of it. Yeah, there's still going to be something in there because most of those, most electronic locks, even if they're a keypad, they're going to have some kind of a key backup. What if you have to get in there and there's a, a power failure and your backup batteries are going? So there's going to be some way to open it with a key. And if there's a way to open it with a key, it's going to have disk tumblers or it's going to have wafers. It's going to have disk detainers. So there's going to be something that is pickable. Now there again, how long is it going to take? Probably if it's a high security uh, keypad lock, they're going to have high security backup mechanical locks as well. And one of the things about lock picking is I talked before about being not wanting to be obvious and also being want, not wanting to be evident. Part of this is how long is it going to take you and how much how much are you going to need by way of tools? If you've got a file cabinet, you can get in with, through, with a jiggler in a few seconds. Probably even people who are walking around the office aren't going to notice that you're not using a real key. Whereas if you're spending a half an hour crouched down using different tools, they're going to notice something's going on. So part of the security of a lock is how long is it going to take and what kind of tools are going to be needed? Um, I don't know that there is any lock that is unpickable. You'll see things advertised sometimes as unpickable or pick resistant, but then there are a lot of people on YouTube and elsewhere who love that as a challenge. They, they may take designing new tools, it may take designing new techniques, but they'll figure out some way to get in it. But most people the lock is trying to protect against aren't going to build new tools and spend a month coming up with a new technique. Yeah, Bruce? Okay, so you mentioned you uh, start out your day and you might pick your, you have a case there with little yep. picks and stuff, and then thinking about what you might take with you that you might need during the day. <laughs> For what? <laughs> it's usually if I'm, busy, if, I, if I'm visiting somebody and we're going to practice on picking locks or things like that. <laughs> It's all about your picking lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> I was warning if anybody was going to call me out, but no, it's just you know I'm I'm going to be I'm going to be showing off some locks and showing how I've picked them or testing something else out. Practically speaking, like I said, this is not something I literally carry every day because not every day calls for lock picks. At least, at least in my life. For a safe where you have a dial, is it the same type of thing that there are more things that your movies you hear? I've seen movies where you want to stuff yeah. so and they're doing it. Yes. They tend not to be exactly the same as a pen tumbler because you're not lifting things up into position. Instead, it's a little bit more like those disc locks that I showed, in that there are a bunch of different discs, and there are pins on those discs that will turn the disc inside depending on which way you're turning the, um, the, the dial. That's why when you're opening those combination locks, it'll usually the instructions will be, uh, start out by turning it to the right three times, then start going to the numbers. Because the first thing you need to do is get them lined up in the right place. And then each rotation is going to change each one of those disks. And if there's three numbers in the combination, it probably means there's three disks that have to be lined up in the right way. And when those are lined up, there's a space in the disk that now allows the handle to be turned and the bolt to be moved. So it's not the same mechanism. And uh, yet there are a lot of people who are into lock picking are also into that. Uh, for, for combination locks, it's generally not called picking, it's called decoding. It's really what you're doing is trying to figure out what is the code that represents what's happening inside the lock. And also there are a lot of bypass methods where you can just stick things in between the little dials on the skinny luggage locks that will, will pop it open for, for bypass locks. Yeah. Is it true you can use a paper clip to open uh, handcuffs? You can use a paper clip to open handcuffs. You, maybe. There are universal, there are very common, very simple shapes for handcuffs, uh, for handcuff key mechanisms. There are you know, universal handcuff keys. That's why that, uh, that card punch out I'm going to show you was able to include a handcuff key that would work in a lot of handcuffs. There are higher security handcuffs that are designed to be a little more uh, too difficult to pick, but I, I would bet that there are still a lot of handcuffs out there with 
you know how they work and you've got a little bit of time and a paperclip, you can figure out how to open. Yeah, Mike. Yes. Matthew, when you oh. spell um, snap guns, electric picks, and you mentioned you said the types of organizations that would use that, other than maybe a locksmith that would want in, you know, quickly, who would cast always in the movies? You see some young cop just kick the door, you know, <laughs> you know and they go in and the with the well, yeah, it could be it could be police, it could be someone executing a warrant, it could be firefighters, it could be military. Uh, there's a concept of you know, entry on demand. Like, you know, I have the authority to get in here when I say I need to get in here, and that can be it can be used as an entry on demand tool. A battering ram can also be an entry on demand tool, but that doesn't pass the uh, the the uh, non evident test. <laughs> yeah. and uh, you probably would. Would see bail bail bonds, bail bounty. Excuse me. You probably see bounty hunters using some of these. Speaking of uh, her question, do you think that like after paramedics or fire departments be like like to try something like that, or would they just break the door and someone lives and say, you know? Yeah. I'm just thinking like you know, if some somebody calls in. You know, I think my neighbor may have collapsed or something, and the, the paramedics from the door is locked. Do you think they would do something like that? You know, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me, but I honestly can't say that I know. The picture would be, you know, on the one hand, you would avoid property damage, but on the other hand, you know, somebody might be dead and you could have a in hurry. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I would expect that to be the case. I wouldn't be surprised if. First responders, emergency personnel of some kind would have some kind of lock, if not picking, bypass capability. Uh, it, uh, it certainly would make sense. Hey, Matthew, I've got a question. Oh, great. Hey, Greg. So I don't know what kind of lock it's called, but it, the key is just, it looks like a round cylinder and then there's little knobs on the end of it. Oh, it's so like, like a, a, on uh, washing machines at the laundromat, right? Right, like yeah. Coin box. It's, a, it's called a tubular key. It's like a smooth cylinder, maybe with a little peg to turn, but the end of it is jagged. That works in a very similar way to a pin tumbler lock. It's kind of pin tumbler lock, but instead of the pins coming down into the cylinder, the pins are on the edge, the end of the cylinder protruding in. So if you think of the, the jagged edge of that, of that uh, the tubular key, Think of your, your house key wrapped in a, into a circle with all of its jagged edges. And that's the end of that tubular key. All right. So, so if you're there again, you can that, pick in there. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, would that be like a single pick to try to get that? Or is there special tools for them? Or well, you could single pick those kind of tubular keys. It's a little tricky. You'd want a very, a very straight, very narrow uh, pick, probably. But there are tools specifically designed to do that. It's essentially a tool that's a handle with a bunch of spokes coming out the end, and each one of those spokes would represent where a pin would be inside the lock. And you move those spokes forward into the, the keyway to, uh, to engage those pins while you're turning. So it can be single pin picked with a simple tool, but you can also get tools that make that easier. Awesome, thank you. The, 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 hmm? the dimpled keys. The dimpled keys, uh, those can be tough to pick, but again, there are specific picks that are designed. It's a similar idea, but it's all about moving things inside the lock based on how the key is shaped. But yeah, dimpled pins or dimpled locks, that's another uh, variation on this kind of mechanism. Any other questions either here or, or folks online? Oh, yeah. So sometimes you read that so many people was killed and there's no sign of force injury. Mm -hmm. So here would be a place where a lock picker could make it look like a friend or family member committed this murder and they didn't. Yeah, that's possible. What kinds of things would you look for to see if the lock had been picked? If, if I had some reason to suspect that the lock had been picked, I would look for, I'd look for one thing, I'd look for certain kinds of scratches on the outside of the lock, outside the keyway. Because when you're just inserting a key and turning it, that's not, not going to engage a whole lot with the face of the lock. If you've got this L-shaped turning tool and you're pushing force, the part that might scrape against the outside of the, 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 the face of the 
uh, plug and make some scratches there. There might be some other telltale scratches in the QA. I know that there are experts who kind of know exactly what to look for, but essentially it's that. What would, what marks would be left by a tool that wouldn't be left by a key that's supposed to open the stock? What kind of locks do they use in in bank in banks? In banks? Yeah. Like if, like if you have a safety plan box. And then you know it's like they have a key and you have a key. How much blocks are those? I mean. Uh you know, to be honest, I don't know, which must be proof of my my innocence here. <laughs> but there are there are a few kinds of locks that are or ways of that are designed to and make make it necessary to have two different keys. So there are two different lock figures together. <laughs> right. right. So a lot of those are just it's just two different keys. There is there are two different locks. There's a lock and it's the same lock for all of the safe deposit boxes and that's the key that the guy the, the guy the bank has. And then the other lock is different for every one of the boxes and that's the key the depositor has. But there have been designs for locks at various times that it's like a, a single housing and two different plugs or a plug with two different keyways, a few different ways to, to get around the fact that maybe there's a person. Sometimes it's because we don't want any one person to be able to open this. They have to cooperate. Other times it's this is something where there's one person that needs to be able to open all of these. But, there, but nobody else should be able to open all of these. Everybody else should only be able to open their lock. And there are different either things that are designed to work with a master key, it can be opened either with one specific master key or with a different key for each lock, or some of these techniques that had two different key ways. So the bottom line is that any sort of keyed lock is probably the field. It probably is, just because ultimately the key is going in there and it's moving something. And if the key is moving something inside the lock, it's theoretically possible to move those same things in the right ways with other tools. Now, sometimes you, you see locks that are just, they're so complicated inside. There's a combination of pins, and dimples, and, uh, and wards so that the key, you see some keys that are kind of hook shaped because they have to go in and wrap around. And only when they've gotten past a ward do they start engaging the pins. So there are ways to make locks really, really, really hard to pick. I don't know that there's a way to make them impossible to pick. The bottom line is the only secure would be a <clears throat> mechanically operated deadbolt. Right. And even that, what is operating the deadbolt? Is yeah. it a, is there a key necessary? Do you have a person who is putting it in place? Because yeah. the deadbolt, it has to be able to move or the door is a wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh question I regret asking this how secure are our latches like our window latches and things that are not meant to be keyed over from the other side but just have some sort of latching mechanism on the inside. Well yeah they could make a great point there that they're not really locks they're latches they're designed you can you there's you don't need any special knowledge or special object like a key to move them. You just have to have access to the latch itself. So really, they are as secure as your ability to prevent people from getting access to. If it's a little window latch on the other side of a glass window pane, it is as secure as the window pane is hard to break and as the person who wants it is willing to break that window pane. Or if you want to make sure, you want to know how secure are the edges of whatever it's securing. Can you reach in there with a wire or another tool and get access to that latch, even though you're on the wrong side. It's kind of like those door latches we were talking about, where even if I'm on the side where it's supposed to keep me out, if I can reach in there with a tool that goes to the other side and pulls towards me, then I've operated that latch from the quote unquote wrong side. So yeah, those are, they're, they're mechanically extremely secure, but security wise, they're only as secure as your ability to keep other people from getting access to them. Those of us of a certain age cannot tell you stories about how we used to use Philip Hanger instead of Mother or Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then, yeah. 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 Can't do that. The bed pillows are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You see those? Or those slim gems, the little strip of metal with the hooks on the end. That's a bypass technique. You're not messing with the lock. The lock nothing, it doesn't have anything to do with the lock. You're reaching past the lock to engage the thing that the lock 
is supposed to control the mechanism that opens the door. So is that kind of like a credit card kind of thing? Same idea, yeah. Okay. You're bypassing well, you're bypassing the lock to operate directly on the foot or the latch. So you're saying to protect our stuff, we should just have a gun. <laughs> like I said, one of the first, the first solutions was you hire people to stand guard. <laughs> then you trust the people you hire to stand guard. <laughs> <laughs> So, I'm trying to this is where my son and I spent two hours sawing a lot of the wire. Uh, really uh, yeah. So, given your skill level, you've obviously been dabbling in this for a while. You come over to my house and I say, Oh, my lock's reset up. How, and you've never seen my lock before. It's just a plain old front door. How long have you been to you? You first. Uh, I don't know. I'd probably ask the you know, word how long it would take me to call a locksmith. <laughs> because the answer might be wrong. I, 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 I practice as a hobby. It's, it's, if I'm on a conference call and I don't need to have my microphone or my camera on, I might be picking a lock just to just uh, occupy my hands so that I can hear better. But I don't really, I, I, I do have some locks that are essentially house door locks that I've started to practice with. And that's another thing. I mentioned it's bad. it's kind of good to move away from those cutaway practice locks and get other locks. Well, where do you get locks to practice? You can go to hardware stores and buy them. And that's expensive. I'm hesitant to say this because I'm creating competition for myself, but you can go on eBay. If if the entry in eBay has the word lock sport in it, you'll probably pay more. But sometimes you go on eBay and somebody's just got a box of locks. They're clearing out an old hardware store. Somebody changed all the locks in a little apartment building. Now they got all these locks. They want to, some of them have keys, some of them don't. And you can buy 30 locks for 15 bucks on eBay. I don't care if they have keys or not. And I've got a whole bunch of those that give me something to practice on. But I, I haven't practiced enough to say that I could get in at a reasonable time. You'll probably be able to leave to here. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, at least that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so getting your address. <laughs> well, that was fascinating. <laughs>